Thank you, Eric and Kathy. I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker for today, Ahmet Dursan. Ahmet has been a driving force behind my own recent LSP pursuits. It was through the U University of Chicago Language Center and its Office of Language Assessment, of which Ahmet is the director, that I was able to conduct the rigorous research known as domain analysis, and then use the results of that research to design a proficiency test and then a course in legal Spanish. That is the course Eric alluded to that we teach cross-listed at the law school. Other instructors of other languages at the University of Chicago have been able to do similar work thanks to the Language Center and the Office of Language Assessment. Ahmet formally encourages us to pursue innovations in our testing and teaching as co-founder of the Language Pedagogy Innovation Initiative. And he is our go-to person for all things testing and assessment. Ahmet. Can you hear me? Okay, so I have soft voice. That's why I ask for this mic uh, so that I am safe. Uh, thank you so much, Darcy, for this uh, warm introduction. Uh, I don't like formal introductions. This was wonderful, thank you. And uh, welcome everyone, those who come out of Chicago. We're happy to see uh, you in person. This is amazing. This is our first gathering, by the way, after COVID uh, in person. Uh, I am very honored um, to be invited to give this talk in this conference because uh, you probably know I'm outsider, right? I, you know, I, I did not come to your first five conferences. Uh, so, uh, and then who is going to say, who is this person, you know, talking now on the sixth one? Um, so uh, hopefully I, I will close that gap. You know, after this talk, we will be friends uh, still. Uh, and then uh, we'll hopefully have a you know, maybe common feature uh, together. So my perspective today will come from applied linguistics, uh, basically, and mainly uh, from language testing and assessment. That's my kind of expertise. So um, today I will talk about domain analysis uh, as a multidimensional research framework, uh, very heavy words there, but I will open that up. And then we will hopefully claim that if you do that, if you can do that, then you will have an evidence-based alignment uh, for LSP research uh, assessment and curricula. So um, first of all, let's set up some uh, background and context. This is from uh, Darcy and Veronica Lear and Guara, a very recent paper uh, they published. So uh, I really like this statement. So the courses and programs in languages for specific purposes uh, in the US, uh, I think is a humble claim, but I think that can be generalized beyond. Uh, are necessarily decentralized. You know, we all probably agree on that. Uh, again, I really like the word necessarily decentralized. So uh, this takes us to the next part, right? So um, we know that uh, one size does not fit all, right? And this is, I think, to me, one of the strongest, uh, you know, argument that LSP world has you know, and can bring uh, to uh, language education and language learning. Uh, you know, this is uh, very easy to say, you know, one size does not fit all. Um, as you can see this famous comic, you know, uh, it will be very unfair to ask these, uh, you know, participants to take the same test, you know. They are, um, you know, by God created differently to perform different, uh, you know, and if we hold them accountable for the same thing, uh, you know, there will be a lot of um, unfairness and injustice, you know, to many things there. So, but that, what does that mean? So if, if, it, if one size does not fit all, does that mean that we, uh, you know, cannot do anything together, uh, you know, and, and we, we cannot move forward maybe together, uh, you know, in this pursuit um, of LSP. So um, the, the LSP pedagogy has, it is goal, the delivery, right, of the specific knowledge and skills and abilities uh, that one must possess in the, uh, in order to function in the real life, right, in the real world language uh, use context. 
So the question here, uh, what happens when, when we don't have the outcomes for those, uh, when we don't have the functions, when we don't know what it takes to function in those specific domain. And when we say we don't know, I'm specifically pointing out two uh, areas here. So if the outcomes are not available to us through either uh, theoretically rationale, theoretical rationale or data or empirically collected evidence, what do we do? We have choices. Everybody has choices, right? So we can take different directions if we don't have that answer. So it could be, we could rely on the general knowledge um, of and about the domain that, that we have. We could um, rely on our personal observations, interactions and experiences, uh, or we could take a rigorous and a systematic research framework as a path to find that out. So uh, this is my initial claim or talk, I mean, argument that this talk that I'm going to basically deliver today uh, argues that if we don't have those, if we don't have those functions, again, through evidence-based empirical data, uh, we must turn to the process of domain analysis as a rigorous and systematic research framework. So um, then what is domain analysis? You know, domain analysis, you can look at the literature and there are tons of different ways people have been describing it. And mainly these people are from the assessment world. Uh, and that's what this talk is coming from that uh, world to you. So domain analysis is a systematic, this is a very important word, keyword here, systematic analysis of the language used uh, in a particular domain or particular domains in order to identify and then define the specific knowledge, skills, and abilities one must possess in order to function uh, in that specific real world language use context. This is very, again, heavily loaded terminologically. I will open this up a little bit. So um, let's go one by one. So this definition tells us that this process is empirical. That's one of the strongest thing about that. Okay, it is systematic, uh, it is exploratory, uh, and then it is evidence-based. And one of the most important thing to me it does, it shifts the focus uh, to the domain itself, and it is contexts and situations and the tasks. So you become like an explorer of, of the domain. And then therefore it pushes us and focuses on real world language use. And then actually what learners can do with the language, which is the question that Darcy just mentioned you were exploring. So what learners can do with the language is not an easy question. It's a very difficult question. Actually, uh, you know, the answer to that means a lot. It has a lot of consequences, you know, in terms of what we can test, what we can teach. So finding that answer is why I'm giving this talk basically today uh, is to uh, basically showcase one way we can find an answer uh, to this question so that we can actually deliver uh, this. If you remember, maybe most of you have read it, the recent MLA report, uh, you know, about, you know, language, uh, basically, uh, status quo in current uh, days in the United States. Um, I think I kind of summarized that as we have a language crisis, um, you know, uh, in terms of enrollments, in terms of uh, students' motivation, taking classes. So I think LSP um, is a very good response uh, to that crisis, um, you know, it connecting uh, basically language learning purposes to students' real life purposes. That's why they, they are not in our classes. We also uh, had a local survey uh, you know, among our students here exploring why they don't take classes here. And we found that the question from student was, what is it in it for me? They couldn't find any meaningful reason to take the language classes. I mean, the, the situation that MLA reports brings is very complex, is very multidimensional. Um, of course, uh, there are different ways we can respond back, but I think LSP has a very strong position 
And, and that's why I'm so happy to see uh, this forum here. Uh, and you are gonna be, I think, uh, one uh, you know, strong way to respond to this crisis by hopefully reshaping this landscape uh, through LSP research um, and then practice. So um, we need to look at, uh, in order to understand domain analysis and why actually it is uh, needed, we need to a little bit contextualize this uh, you know, in uh, the reverse design framework uh, that was, um, you know, is called backward design by McTighe. You probably have heard that. But uh, here, um, Kathy, uh, you know, when we conceptualized that here, uh, she was referring to this as a reverse design, uh, meaning to reverse engineering, uh, you know, uh, backward instead of backward. And another thing that you see here is assessment driven. Because there are practices, you know, there that they claim to use reverse design framework, but there is no assessment, you know, in the process, uh, which is by itself interesting, uh, you know, because the whole purpose of, uh, you know, reverse design framework is to, you know, be able to define those outcomes initially, and then be able to measure those before you move on to uh, designing the curriculum, basically. So here, the, the pieces of this, uh, the first piece here is what? Target language use domain. So this is the pillar in the reverse design framework, right? Uh, this is basically everything. If we don't have this, we cannot start this process, you know? And then you, you, you see the word target language use domain. It's an assessment term that uh, you know, initiated by Bachman and Palmer uh, initially, but it's now more like a generic term uh, across all uh, language fields. So um, the idea here, again, the same question, what are the learners doing with the language in the real world? As I said, this is a difficult question. So then once, uh, once we uh, have that, you know, that's not easy, but once we have that, we can move on to define what it means, uh, you know, to basically uh, the skills and abilities and knowledge that we are going to measure, we are going to teach. That's what is called construct in testing world. So it's a demonstrable actions or behaviors, basically uh, showing skills or knowledge. Um, you know, basically we are, you know, defining what uh, learners can do uh, and what they should know and what kind of skill set they should have to be able to uh, function there. So the, the third one, uh, and after we have that construct, which is coming from the domain, then we need to operationalize that construct. Uh, in other words, we need to uh, design a test, uh, basically, uh, to make sure we can measure uh, that construct to see whether or not, you know, we gonna get there, we will be there or not. Only then you return to the curriculum, you know, the reason that assessment comes before the curriculum is basically to um, internalize what does it take to be there. And it is gonna be, um, in, in our uh, basically case, we were not uh, buying tests or commercial tests. We were designing our own tests at this stage. So that is also an option, right? Some, some institutions, you know, they do buy external tests uh, you know, to basically uh, measure whether or not uh, the programs or languages have reached those outcomes. Our choice was not that. Our choice was to design our own test based on our own findings and uh, the construct definition we had. And the curriculum basically is, is the big question is, uh, is a path, right? It is a path to you design to get those uh, outcomes. So, if you don't have a test, then the system is gonna be broken, right? In this whole system again, because we need something to tell us whether or not we actually got there. So we need some performance, right? Students' performances, and we have to measure those performances consistently, reliably, uh, to make sure we have fair uh, results and fair decisions. So the performance on the test that we designed uh, will basically um, measures learners ability to carry out those target functions, to carry out the construct in other words. And then uh, it will be the evidence therefore for us uh, to see to what extent they can function in the target language use domain. 
So this is, as a process, is, is very strong uh, in terms of um, you know, uh, design. So there are key claims uh, that this framework is making, okay? I, I'm gonna go over several of those, okay? The first claim this framework is making that target language use domain actually can be identified. That is the first claim and, and defined because if we, if we don't have that, then we, the rest is not there. So the second claim is that the constructs, you know, after we do that uh, analysis of domain or looking at other analyses that were conducted maybe beforehand, that the construct can be also defined and also operationalized. We cannot move on to a test if we cannot operationalize the construct. The test is an operation of the construct. You know, if I look at the test, for example, as an expert, I can easily see what kind of construct is behind it, even if it's not written there. So any test that you give to your students by default basically reflects what kind of construct you have uh, behind the test. So the third argument uh, or claim this framework is making that assessments and curricula can actually be aligned to the target language use domain. That's how it starts, you know, it starts reverse from the real world, from the target language use domain. And the claim is if you can do this, that means there's an alignment. The other uh, claim here that assessments and learning activities are useful for their intended purposes. This is a big claim. Okay, so, and then the last one is the performances at the end, once we have those performances can be generalized to the target language use domain. This is what we all want. This is a promise, right? That we technically make uh, give uh, and have make uh, when we give a syllabi to students uh, who, they, uh, who take our classes. So the whole thing that, that I've just been talking about is results in one big word. This is an argumentative process. Okay, so keep this in mind. So this, the whole process of designing, uh, you know, reverse from the TLU to testing to uh, curriculum is an argumentative process. So there is no prescription, in other words, that saying, okay, a golden standard of saying, okay, this is the only way to go with. The way you will make choices, you will make thousands of choices in that process. And all of those choices are technically claims that you make. And basically uh, that is uh, telling us that the whole process here is argumentative. So, which means, uh, you know, we have to, right, evaluate this process, right? So the, the, if it's an argumentative process, it is made of claims, right? Then we need to evaluate it to see if those are warrant, warranted or hold, right? So, uh, and if you look at from the outcomes for a course or for a program, whether or not we have reached those outcomes should matter and it matters, right? So uh, we therefore need a, a course or a program like a multi uh, course program that can deliver those outcomes to students. And we also need an assessment uh, in place that can measure it, okay? To, for the evaluation to happen. So these are just some questions that comes to mind, but these are not the only question. There, there, there will be probably hundreds of questions, you know, overall that you can uh, you pick and choose to evaluate your course, to evaluate your program. It's a very multi-dimensional process, but these three questions here are basically about the course itself and relevant to the outcomes. So how, how can we, how confidently can we answer these questions when we evaluate uh, our course? And when I say evaluation, I don't mean like a top-down evaluation here. I mean like internally, like a, a kind of organic way of doing this iterative process as a teacher, which we all go through every year. You know, that's technically an evaluation you do. So this uh, course and program evaluation that you are involved basically is also argumentative by nature. You have full of arguments and then you basically need to answer, need to back up those arguments. My claim is that as you can see, I have been positioning this as an argumentative process, which you can argue about, but it is too late to think about it at the end. That's one of the 
next argument I am making in this talk. If you wait until the end to make these arguments compelling, it is too late. So it, it, is, it is basically what I'm trying to tell is going back to the reverse design is why therefore we start from where? We do not start from the curriculum. We start from the target languages domain. Okay, so because we wanna make sure first of all, you know, we have the uh, evidence uh, in, in, in place so that we can build on it the rest of the thing. And that evidence is too late to find at the end if you have something um, already going on. So this takes us to uh, the evidence-centered design. So there are, again, multiple ways you can design a course. There are tons of different ways you can design your curricula. There are many, many ways you can make choices, uh, curricular choices, assessment choices. This is just one that I am proposing as a way to uh, basically make this uh, process rigorous and as a way to make this process systematic and also sustainable. Mainly, I think that's also another uh, you know, benefit. So why, why did I <clears throat> pick up, excuse me, this uh, ECD uh, framework? So um, basically this is again coming from assessment. Uh, here I'm expanding this definition. I hope Ms. Levy will be okay with that. You know, uh, is not just assessment, but also learning uh, is also, uh, I think, included uh, in the uh, kind of claim that we have about ECD. So here I expand the definition um, beyond assessment and saying the development of learning and assessment systems, basically, that we all uh, have uh, throughout the year. But this, what it does, um, it helps you uh, and basically consideration, it gives you the consideration and also collection of evidence uh, from the onset, okay, of the learning and assessment design. That's why I was saying it is too late uh, to think about this at the end. So if we don't wanna be too late, that's in other words, you know, we have to be thinking this from the beginning. So validation or like validation is basically in this case is, is to see whether your course, whether your assessments are working for the purposes they were developed. That's the biggest question of validation. That is a claim you make. If you say it works, it's a claim. Then we need to back up that claim. And where do we find that claim? We can do a lot of things you know, after we designed, after we teach. But at the same time, if we were not thinking about this uh, from the beginning, finding those claims would be a lot more uh, difficult. So basically ECD provides you a tangible concepts and high level of detail that could be used to inform the design decisions. And by doing, uh, by doing basically um, defining and uh, identifying intended outcomes, target functions, assessment models and test design choices, uh, curricular design choices and establishing the link basically here or the alignment between design decisions and intended outcomes. This is the strongest promise of ECD. If you follow this model to design a course, if you follow this model to design a test, uh, basically uh, you have this uh, kind of ground to work from. So what is ECD? I'm gonna quickly go over ECD, but that's not again the, the, the point here, uh, but um, we're gonna come back to domain and ask that the whole reason I'm introducing this model uh, because my talk is on this particular part, domain analysis. So the first step in ECD is what? Domain analysis. What was the first step in a diverse design model? Target language use domain. So basically what this says, if you need to define target language use domain, the first step is what? To do the domain analysis. So basically the, the task here is to define the key aspects and the characteristics uh, of functional language use uh, in a specific domain uh, in this case. Then we're gonna uh, use that evidence, use that findings from domain analysis uh, into next step, which uh, Ms. Levy call as domain modeling is therefore designing task patterns or assessment tasks uh, that represents 
uh, the key aspects of the domain, the key characteristics of the domain. And after you do that, uh, you basically um, establish the design decisions and specification. You write you know, certain specifications and you make those decisions uh, based on the domain modeling. You turn this into like a blueprint. It's like a design, we call it here design metrics. In uh, general, people call it blueprint. Uh, so you basically create a blueprint uh, before you um, move on to develop it. It's a design stage. And then you implement that. You basically um, you know, operationalize uh, those blueprints and then you turn those into assessment tasks and you turn those into test questions. Um, and then you deliver this uh, to your uh, students through whatever means available to you um, at that uh, time. So here, um, the, we're gonna move on now to domain analysis. So the rest of the talk is gonna basically, hopefully summarize or explore how we can do this domain analysis uh, very quickly as much as I can. And then we'll actually uh, give you some examples that were uh, developed here. Uh, uh, you know, as under this program that we have at uh, University of Chicago. So we have, uh, this is how I conceptualize it. There will be different people probably doing it different ways. So I put this in six steps. So the step number one is domain description. Number two, domain components and parameters. Uh, number three, research question and design. Number four, data collection and analysis. Uh, number five, specific knowledge, skills and abilities. And number six, specific domain definition. Now we're gonna go look at each of this. So in the first one, uh, in, in domain description, you can call this domain labeling. Uh, you know, this is the first step in the process. So there are key questions here. There's what is the specific target languages domain you are intending to, you know, work in, right? I mean, uh, teach your students to function in. What is that, what is the purpose of that LSP domain? What is the context? Who is the target audience? And how accessible is that specific domain is to you as a researcher? Uh, you know, in this case, I'm talking about from the research perspective, is it accessible you know, for you to analyze even? That's a big question because if it's not accessible, then, you know, then you're not there, you cannot collect the data. And there are certain cases where those domains are because very sensitive, because very confidential, might not be accessible or some pieces of it might not be accessible. Again, uh, these are just some key questions, but key considerations is the more ambitious domains requires more ambitious domain analysis. So the bigger your domain is, the amb more ambitious your analysis will be. So uh, for example, academic language proficiency versus North American academic writing versus Chinese language skills for digital commerce, you know, are gonna require different uh, analysis and different, um, you know, scale at different scale. You cannot just, you know, there is no golden prescriptive standard of doing domain analysis. It is not top down. It is all bottom up. And it, you as a researcher is the agent here deciding on all of this. You know, of course, based on your uh, interest and based on your context. So in other words, the disadvantage, if you keep it too narrow, then you can only generalize the consequences, right? The target languages domain to that narrow domain. So it matters. The way, the way you label your domain, it matters a lot because it brings in a claim by itself immediately. When you name a domain, you are actually claiming what you have is generalizable to that domain. So finding that is, is the first step. And that is going to be a lot of brainstorming, you know, a lot of, you know, back and forth, uh, you know, refining. Uh, this is like doesn't uh, look as easy as it is on the paper here. So the next one is domain components. After you, you kind of identify your domain and, and you kind of define it as parameters, you are going to decide what kind of uh, domain components to analyze. Each domain will have tons of components and some of them are gonna be very hard to access. Some of them are gonna be easy maybe to access. Some of them are gonna be expensive. Uh, some of them are gonna be maybe cost-effective. So you're gonna keep all this in mind. 
And then you're gonna ask, you know, these are just some key questions. These are not uh, prescriptive at all. These are just to give us some food for thought. Um, so for example, who are the stakeholders in this domain, right? Um, and then how are they engaged with the domain? What are their roles? Yeah, what are the key documents, archives, text in, in the LSP domain, right? What are the essential context, situation, and tasks? And what are the key parameters of the LSP domain? So this will help you basically, um, you know, identify which components uh, you should be uh, looking at to analyze. Some key considerations here, this is not a, pres a, a prescriptive, like one project will not apply to another one unless you're doing exact same thing. So this is, this is something that you built, uh, again, from the bottom up, and it, as again, by itself, again, it's an argumentative process. So the goal here is, though, to collect sufficiently unbiased evidence. That's a very important point here. Because this will later become very important for all the arguments you make regarding what uh, you know, students should be doing and how you test it and how you teach it. You know, choices, uh, you need to justify these component choices. You, can, you cannot just randomly pick two or three. Uh, you need to you know, justify your choices. Like why these three, why not the other two, for example. So, and you need to consider practicality, like your resources and return on investment here, like how much time you're gonna invest on this and what would you get in return? Okay, so what kind of information can you get from that component? If it's not very fruitful, uh, although maybe it's very attractive uh, component, but the question is what kind of information that component can provide you uh, regarding the domain? And then you're gonna consider, of course, your resources context. The third one um, is now, once you define your component, you're gonna turn to identifying and actually writing your research questions. So uh, the first key, how many components are you gonna include in your research? Again, the wider the domain is, the more ambitious the analysis should be. Okay, so keep that in mind. And then the number of components you will need to include will depend on that. If you're planning to publish this, you need to also consider that because uh, you need to make sure you have enough uh, data you know, uh, to be able to publish this kind of research. So what kind of research design can answer your research question? Is it qualitative? Is it quantitative? Is it mixed methods? What else you know, goes into that? What kind of information can each component provide? How can you ensure triangulation? You know, making sure the data is not biased. You know, who are your participants? Uh, you know, who are you gonna go to to collect this data? How will the data be collected and recorded? In what order are you gonna collect and record this data? Some key considerations here is that this is, should be, I mean, it should be exploratory research. So you do not go to this domain with a hypothesis in mind. You know, that means you already have some analysis there. You know, you're gonna be in appraisal mode more to check whether or not those are true. That's a different mode. We, I'm not talking about that today. Okay, I'm talking about uh, you doing this as an exploratory research. You basically go with clean slate. You know, you look at the domain to see, okay, what is going on here? Uh, and this is by default uh, exploratory. And you need to consider your human subjects, IRB processes, of course, um, and you need to also look at the dynamic nature of domain components. If certain components are very dynamic and they keep changing, you know, uh, you know the question is, should we even look at that? you know, for example. So, and also when you write your questions, make sure your questions are specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. This is for all the research projects, you know, uh, holds true. So the step four, the data collection and analysis. Uh, so some of the key questions, what instruments do you need to collect the data, okay? And uh, what kind of instruments are you gonna use to analyze the data? Okay, how can you uh, sure, be sure that you know, your uh, analysis is objective and consistent? What kind of coding schemes are you gonna develop, right? All of this, what kind of software are you gonna use? These are all the key questions that you need to consider as you think about that. So some of the uh, considerations here, so the choices of data collection and analysis, the methods and the tools must align with your research question. That's the key basically point here that we cannot give up on. So is like, if you are familiar with OPI, actual OPI, so one of the first thing you learn that, asking the right question matters, because based on the question you ask, you get what 
you were hoping or not hoping. You know, elicitation matters. So here's the same thing. If it depends on what you want to elicit here, so asking the right questions matters a lot. But at the same time, the methods, the analysis tools, the data collection tools must align with that as well. So the step five uh, is is now once we collect the data, we we analyze that data. So we are now into the uh, you know five step five. So we are trying to identify now the patterns among all those components that we looked at. And basically we have, what are the key situations, context and content of the LSP domain, okay? What does it take to function in the domain? What are the key tasks and interactions in this domain that the users are engaged? Okay, what are the key knowledge, skills and abilities to successfully complete these tasks? What are those? What did you find? So you're gonna be looking at basically this and trying to uh, find patterns across your uh, data collection analysis, you know, because the whole point of doing that was to find answer for these questions, okay? So one of the important stuff here is that again, you need to let the data talk. This is very important, uh, you know, and keep it exploratory. I know, and then embrace surprises. Believe me, we, I have had the most surprise in my life as a testing person. I'm gonna show some of them very soon, uh, being engaged with this uh, domain analysis beyond English, uh, you know, uh, be, be ready for the surprises, okay? So embrace those surprises, even if you don't like them, you know? And I will ex give one example. Do not let your preferences shadow the findings. This is not about your preferences. Okay, this might be a very strong statement, uh, but it, it is naturally part of the domain analysis research is we let the data talk, okay? And that's gonna be your power. That's gonna be your strength uh, eventually because which will help you argue later uh, about everything else you need to put together. So then the last, the last piece of, of this step is of course finding then, uh, you know, the defining this domain. This is by the way, gonna be unique to you. You know, to begin with, you started doing this because something like this was not available. Now you came back to this. Remember this was the first basically step in the reverse design. Now we are ready to define this, okay? So here uh, we are gonna define this in terms of certain questions. Again, these questions are just to give you some thought, but there are endless other questions. So which skills are in more or less demand? That's a big deal, right, to find that out. What skill set is required from a learner to function in this domain, right? What does it take to engage in an authentic situation in that domain, okay? And be interacting with the users in that domain, or not just users, like texts sometimes, okay? And how these skills can be uh, represented, you know, in assessment tasks. You know, we think about that because if it's not operationalized, remember, we don't wanna define it, you know, because we wanna make sure it's operationalized, can be operationalized. And what language theory can provide help to define this? Depending on how you, uh, your belief or, or your choices of language methodology and theory, you're gonna be defining this differently. You know, for example, actful can do statements are different than, uh, you know, common European framework can do statements in Europe. And they are different from the world language standards, whatever. So we have different ways. And, and the reason is, you know, is, is that your choice of language theory will impact the way you define the domain. If, if you are believing in interactionist approach, for example, in second language acquisition, the way you will define this will be completely different than if you're believing in, let's say, other approaches. So the TLU is, is basically shadowed, your definition of target languages domain is impacted by three things. By, by your view of what it means to know a language, by your view of underlining factors relating to the ability to use the language, and also by your view of how we understand specific instance of language use. These three things are gonna be here all the time, you know, and they will impact how you will define this. So the target languages domain can be, let's say you could do domain analysis, you know, and, and those analysis were given to different people at this stage with two different uh, theoretical, you know, uh, basically backgrounds, you could end up with two different definitions. You know, uh, that is, that's how, and that's why, you know, uh, we need to be careful the way we approach this, 
you know, we need to basically ask this question, how am I grounding this? Like, is it communicative competence? Is it proficiency oriented? Uh, is it like something else, for example? Uh, this will impact uh, your choices here. Okay, so uh, in the remaining eight minutes, uh, so I, ha I have Kathy uh, is very good at keeping time. So I'm looking at her. Uh, so making sure I'm uh, not over time. So I'm gonna share some exciting studies, except mine. Uh, so everything else is uh, exciting. So the, the first one, um, you know, before I do that, I, I, you know, this is like a fertile land of research. You know, uh, that's why another thing I wanna say. So uh, there is a lot, there is a scarcity of domain analysis research. Like, uh, you know, in a, in a recent study that uh, I and my colleague did, uh, you know, we looked at actually um, journals from 2000 to 2018. Okay, we have a systematic analysis of the journal studies. We didn't just look at the journals because we thought let's look at the dissertations, let's look at the research reports. So we expanded the whole thing. The number we found was 12. Okay, so there are only 12 studies. I mean, this is before 2019, okay? This is before Darcy's and other colleagues come in. So the number will increase and has increased since then. I know that, <laughs> you know, but this is also like, a, a, we, we look at the whole, like wide array of, of language uh, testing assessment, you know, journals here. Uh, and these are just some examples you see here, but only 12, okay? so in the past eight, like 18, uh, I would say years. So uh, let's look at the three, uh, four studies quickly. Uh, and I, hopefully this will justify the six steps I just explained, you know, to show you like how diverse, you know, this process is for each one of this and, and why it's, it cannot be prescriptive. That's why I'm choosing four coming completely from four different angles. So the first one is a study that again, I conducted um, in, in a project that was involved in Europe. Uh, so uh, basically we look at the 21st century workplace English communication as a domain, as you can see, is a very ambitious claim we are making here. It's a bigger domain. Uh, and then our target audience were prospective employees in global corporations. This is for English. Domain components we look at were talent acquisition managers. We, we actually interviewed um, you know, talent acquisition managers in global corporations. We looked at business magazines, we looked at LinkedIn reports, we looked at the textbooks, we looked at the published literature, for example. So um, the data collection instruments were surveys, interviews, literature review, uh, reports, textbooks, and magazines. So the key skill set we found, you know, as you can see, it's not four skills, it's a six skill, uh, you know, domain definition we had. So we, we actually claim that communication strategies and also intercultural communication should be defined as a skill and should be tested therefore uh, for someone uh, to be able to function there. This is not a very common and the reason we could say it because we found it. You know, this, this, is, this is what it is. You know, uh, it, we found that to be very vital to someone's communication, for example, breakdowns, you know, in that context. So moving, um, so we therefore rewrote CFR, which, uh, you know, they don't like, but, you know, the, the CFR is, is not like written for all purposes. You know, we had to rewrite the whole CFR, you know, basically based on these findings, uh, you know, using the specific, uh, you know, findings from them. And the example here, for example, uh, in writing A1 level, which is the very beginning can write simple and short text but we say brief emails, short memos, text messages, conveying essential information to someone as a part of business transaction on response to simple and straightforward requests or question. It's very specific, very targeted. If you compare this to A1 writing in regular CFR, there is no even connection here. So uh, the other one from uh, Lear 2019, uh, legal Spanish public interest law in the US Law students were the target audience here and also college students at the University of Chicago. So um, Darcy looked at the stakeholder feedback, looked at the government resources, looked at the nonprofit organizations, textbooks, media, academic articles, and documents. Very ambitious, actually. You see there's tons of components here. Uh, and then data collection instruments were meetings, interviews, observations, field notes, email correspondence, and also conference attendance, which is probably this one, right? Was it <laughs> maybe, no? Okay, so, um, okay. This component was not useful then, okay. 
So um, key, key skill set were reading, listening, oral proficiency, sight translation, first ever I heard in my life, and then culture. You know, what is missing here? Typical thing that is missing here. Writing. Why don't we have writing? Is it is a claim, right? You make, you, Darcy making a claim saying there is no reason to have writing in this LSP domain. It's a very strong claim, but she has evidence that writing was not at all needed because they do not write in Spanish in this domain. Okay, so uh, here is one, again, can do statement that this is the end result uh, came in, uh, you know, uh, again, very different than these were uh, re uh, written according to actful proficiency guidelines, basically uh, principles. Uh, we, use, we use same kind of mentalities, proficiency oriented. They are proficiency oriented. They are performance based can do statements. So as you can see, the speaking here is gonna be irrelevant to intermediate uh, speaking or advanced speaking um, can do statement act for. If you wanna read here more, I'm gonna have some free advertisement here. Uh, Darcy is talking about this at 3.15 today. Uh, I'm not charging this, you know, uh, so free. Uh, so, and, and then uh, you can learn more, okay? I'm just, not, I'm, this is just a spoiler I'm giving you. So the uh, Moraga 2020, I also did another one here at University of Chicago, clinical social work this time. Again, uh, looked at practical communicative ability uh, in various social services, clinical settings in Spanish speaking areas. So and students and professors even interested in social work uh, were taking this class. So the domain components that she looked at were students, school administrators, something new we came to see, right? Her prospective employers that we didn't see before, but relevant here, uh, textbooks and syllabi. Okay, so, and then she used surveys, interviews, classroom observations, text analysis, and then the, she found oral proficiency, uh, interpretation, translation, writing and reading. What is missing here? Typical, uh, we don't have speaking and we don't have listening. Speaking and listening are embedded as what? Oral proficiency here, because they could not be separated in the domain. That's what she found. You know, uh, and that's why we call this oral proficiency rather than speaking and listening as two different skills, okay? One thing that I was shocked and surprised with both Darcy and uh, Veronica's studies that as a testing person, one of the key principles, if there are any testing uh, people that can uh, confirm, one of the key principles in testing is you do not include sensitive information in your tests. Uh, you do not, you avoid any biased materials, you avoid any sensitive materials that can trigger any kind of emotions. That's the number one rule in testing because you want that performance not to be impacted by anything else, but just the cognitive ability and the mental capacity there. But in both of these cases, everything is sensitive. You know, all the inputs that I would reject normally came in. Okay, so we're, we're here. So by, by default, and this was one of the, again, as I said, embraced surprises. As a testing, I reshifted my mindset is because there were no research like this before. And now we have it, we could refine that, that kind of thing. And this is um, uh, Moraga's basically um, uh, description of oral proficiency, one of just one of the uh, can do statements she ended up with. Again, another advertisement here uh, for free. Uh, if you are interested in hearing more, uh, is it, uh, she's talking at two in room 701. So last one, probably one of the, uh, out of box one, uh, Colin is here. Uh, so uh, here, so Latin for scholarly discussion. Uh, so Latin classroom uh, as language for specific purposes. Normally remember, we were talking about real world, real world, like as of something beyond classroom. This time, what is unique about this is that the classroom itself is the domain uh, because that's where Latin is used, you know, uh, th that's it. You know, uh, so the main components were students and faculty, Latin classes and syllabi. Uh, and then um, he used surveys, interviews and classroom observations. Uh, and then the key skill set that my pronunciation, reading, listening and philology. You know, we don't have, of course, speaking and we don't have writing because they were not relevant, you know. Uh, so um, the one of the one of the can do set is interesting, like from philology point of view says, you know, can identify which specific words 
or phrases are causing difficulty in interpretation when comprehension fails. You know, uh, and one thing interesting thing about um, Shelton's study is that uh, different skills were found to be at different proficiency levels. They're not all like intermediate mid level, for example. You know, each one of them, because of what is needed to function in the domain, were uh, you know put at a different uh, basically proficiency level. And again, one more advertisement. This is the last one. So he is also talking about today in room 07 at 345. If you want to hear more about that. So I am finishing up uh, with, with one of this last slide. So concluding remarks, basically, I, I hope I could uh, you know, give you this uh, you know, evidence enough that you basically agree with me um, that LSP domain analysis are essential, A, to ensure an evidence-based alignment across LSP research, assessment, and curricula, regardless of discipline. So this is where decentralization is kind of coming together. You know, uh, so here it is essential to align course goals, content, materials, activities to students' goals. This is again, the strongest promise LSP can provide, you know, uh, in, in, in to students. I think this is the biggest advantage LSP has. Uh, and, and, and therefore we need to make sure we actually are aligning with students' real life goals. So it can deliver the essential knowledge, skills, abilities to be able to function in the LSP domain. And then it will um, you know, help us to implement fair, useful and meaningful assessments. It will also help us interpret learners' performances in our classes or in our courses accurately and also make uh, accurate decisions. And that is the big deal. Therefore, you know, at the end, this will hopefully ensure a positive washback you know, of everything you have done on stakeholders, meaning you included as a teacher, as a researcher, as a professor, and also your students with that. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Kathy and I have mics, so we can come around to answer, to take your questions. Thank you very much, Ahmed. That was very nice to, to hear. And you may or may not know, but those of us in LSP come from very different academic backgrounds. For example, my PhD was in literary studies. And so I'd like to give a shout out to rigorous humanistic essays too. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, what, toward the end, I think you were getting to this, but what about uh, dispositions and attitudes? And um, a lot of what we want to do, or at least some of us, is we want our students to not just know how the language is used in a domain, we want them to challenge that use. We want them to question that use. We want them to fight for social justice. I, if they go to ICE, if they go to policing, if they go to law, I don't want them to just do what is already there. So I would be curious to know your thoughts about that. Yeah, that is wonderful. Uh, very, very, very good question. I, I think uh, that also uh, ensures why domain analysis is needed. Uh, going back to my second step, defining the components. That is you who is gonna define what kind of components to look at to obtain that information. If as a goal, if you have this, therefore you should include, you know, for example, the human rights, for example, uh, nonprofit organizations in that world as one of your components, for example. You know, you should, it's, you have full control, by the way, when you do domain analysis in terms of basically what components you look at and therefore what you're gonna find out at the end and how you're gonna define it. You know, no one will come and question you because you added that component on top of that. You know, uh, that is you, that's why you are the agent. One of the most powerful thing about this, actually it makes you the agent, become the agent of the whole process. You know, that, that goes back to, again, I think it's very doable. I, I think um, you need to therefore include people who can inform you what, what can be done in terms of language. And, and you need language to do those kind of stuff. Yeah, I hope I answered your questions, yeah. 
thank you very much, very interesting. Um, so at the end you talked, and one of the categories often that we're looking at is what, like, what do students need, but then also there's what do students want, right? And, um, which is fine, that's great. I, we could have a whole discussion about do they even really know enough to know what they want, but that's not my point. I am having students who don't know what they want, right? So they, they, they know they wanna learn language and then they don't know which class to choose and then they end up in your class. And, and so the assumption sometimes in that question of, well, if they're law students, they want this. Or, so can you talk to a little bit about that, the age of students and what does it mean what students want? Yeah, so very, very, uh very timely question uh, and very important question. I think we are struggling with that, um, you know, everywhere, I think, uh, as a language community. So um, I, I think one thing that, that we uh, should do uh, is, is basically having this um, kind of more um, proactive kind of outreach, you know, as a language community. This, this again, and not, nothing to do with LSP, but overall, you know, as a proactive outreach to reach to the students, which means we need to understand, first of all, what they want. You know, there is no harm in asking what they want, you know, and, and if we find out they don't know what they want, then I think it's all what it takes is to communicate, right? So it's to basically outreach. We have basically taken granted, you know, that students are just because language is required, for example, will be in our classes and will be happy and will be just, you know, okay. That's not the case. That's not what they think. Um, so we need to basically show them the value of this. So which I call value creation, I think which is very much missing in, in our like way of uh, advertising uh, basically languages. Uh, we just, you know, wait students to come. I think we should not wait for students to come. And that's why I think one of the reasons is why we have these low enrollments and it's going down, you know, uh, dramatically, you know, nationally. Um, you know, certain languages are more secure than the others, but the situation is not very bright, especially for less commonly taught languages. I think one reason is because we are not proactive. You know, we take it granted. We should reach out to students. We should listen to them. Uh, we should have a conversation, a dialogue with them so that we actually get them. This is like a, you know, a very normal thing to do in business world, uh, but sometimes we take it granted in academic, uh, you know, settings. I hope that answers your question. Thanks so much. Um, I just want to ask, oh, hey, good to see you. Um, I just wanted to ask you kind of a testing slash LSP question. Yeah. Um, one of the things I hear from a lot of students, what they want is a job, uh -huh. eventually, at least as a parent of a college student, that's what I want them to want. Uh -huh. um, so um, what's the role of certification in LSP um, and what kinds of things should we be working toward? You know, we've been very successful in terms of um, teacher certification, right. but obviously some of these areas require a little more. Yeah, wonderful question. Uh, so I, uh, I, I, I created <laughs> uh, a program at University of Chicago called Foreign Language Proficiency Certifications, uh, exactly for that reason. Um, it's, it's not just LSP, but we have all of the LSP projects that we are developing here actually turn into a real life certification. Uh, which can they can take to the you know job interviews you know whatever I think it's a fundamental uh, it's a must take step uh, forward and we have a, a session on Friday you know about biliteracy you know for example biliteracy seal you know and I um, just saw the advertisement from Actful you know that uh, you know these certifications probably will be increased. Uh, and also the test number of tests in different languages will be increased in less commonly taught languages will be added. That's amazing. That's actually what they want. This is exactly what students want. They, they, we, we surveyed 900 students um, last year, two years ago, before COVID. Uh, and again, our focus one was on students who do not take classes. And we ask open-ended questions like, why don't you take classes? So the overall answer is consistently the same. They say, there is nothing in it for me. Yeah, and this is in an institution where there is a language requirement. You know, every single college student here has to take a foreign language. So I think, again, it, it's the gap here. It is the gap we have between what we think we can give versus what students think they can get from us. And we are getting distant from each other. That's, I think, very dangerous. <laughs>
And that's what the MLA report is what telling us basically is we need to be proactive, you know, and LSP is one of the place. I think this is your strongest promise, as I'm saying, and I'm so excited to see this community and hopefully this will grow bigger and bigger because this is one of the strongest response to that crisis moment, I think, um, in a very tangible way. And what, do we have time? One more, I think one more. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Pilar Ortega and I am a physician, so I come from a very different background uh, from most of you here. And one of the issues in medical Spanish that I wanted to bring up is I was very interested in your comment about LSP courses being necessarily decentralized and reinventing the wheel is kind of one of those things that is a big problem for us in medical Spanish because we all tend to do things in silos and then not necessarily collaborate or communicate. Mm -hmm. um, so extending this to the domain analysis, to what extent um, is it replicable in your opinion within a you know, particular domain analysis and how do we approach that? You know, if a, uh, I need linguists and language assessment experts to work with me on this, for example, so it's very challenging to do that and time consuming to do this kind of work. Um, how replicable is it, you know, and how can we kind yeah. of overcome those things? Yeah, I think uh, to me, one of the uh, distinguishing quality of research, if I were judging research uh, studies, is whether or not they can be replicable. To me, that's a big deal, right? This is like just general, uh, you know, this is like a big quality, it matters a lot, right? If you do a research and cannot be replicated, you know, uh, I mean, it's gonna end somewhere. Uh, you know, uh, so that's that's kind of that's why we also call this a rigorous research framework. A is a framework which means it can be replicated across different things. Uh, it can bring collaborations because it's research, and most importantly, it does not have a set definition of target language domain here. It lets you and your group, let's say, to define those parameters. If you narrow down it to your own context, of course, it will be only applicable to your own context. If you narrow down it to the field, then it's gonna be more open and replicated and sustainable. And that's not true for every LSPs. Some LSPs are necessarily, you know, actually very contextualized because they are designed for that purpose. But if you expand the goal, expand the purpose and collaborate and make this LSP research more rigorous, the way you can generalize the findings will be more, of course, um, you know, uh, open. I hope. Okay, I guess this is it. Uh, if you have other questions, I'm happy to take in. I'm going to be here until Saturday. So. Yeah. And I just want to say, oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.